Hello, everyone. I'm Solome Tibabu, the host of Going Digital Behavioral Health Tech. I'm really looking forward to our session with Bill Smith from Inseparable today. Um, Bill, welcome. Can you first tell our audience a little bit about yourself and, and Inseparable, please? Sure thing. And, and thank you, Solome. It's great to be with you. Um, so I'm Bill Smith. I started Inseparable uh, a little over two years ago. Um, at the beginning of uh, the pandemic, when we saw the the pretty devastating impact that it was having um, almost immediately on people's mental health. And the idea behind Inseparable is that the health of our minds can't be separated from the health of our bodies. And yet that's what our public policy process uh, and frankly, the way we deal with mental health writ large does to us every day. And so we started Inseparable to build a true social movement and a political force behind creating the change that we know needs to happen uh, for mental health. Um, On the personal side, I come to this um, after losing my brother to uh, mental illness after a really long struggle, trying to get the treatment right, trying to get the access right. Um, And, you know, I think there are so many families out there who've been touched by this issue, um, not all as severely as mine, but uh, what we're trying to do is build a movement. So all of those people are invited into the conversation, a part of uh, the the opportunity to change our broken system and our, uh, frankly, broken approach to mental health. Thanks so much. And for sharing as well. Um, I know we were definitely proud to support Inseparable through the Upswing Fund for Adolescent Mental Health and your timing couldn't be better. Could you talk a little bit more about Inseparable's mission and your core priorities? Absolutely. And, you know, this is such a huge area that one of the most important things for us when we started was to figure out exactly what we could do, where we thought we could make a difference, and frankly, where we could because there are a lot of great organizations that are doing different pieces of mental health advocacy work, uh, many of whom we partner with. Um, But we said, what if we can focus in on three core areas where if we solve these problems, we will dramatically improve the lives of people uh, in our country and their mental health. So for us, those three problems are kind of at the core of what we do every day. And here's here they are. The first is closing the treatment gap. There's a huge number of people um, who need access to care who aren't getting it. And we've got to close that gap. The second is that we know mental health issues can start early in life. Um, Over half, actually, of mental health conditions uh, tend to start by the time someone has reached the age of 14. And so we need to invest in early intervention and prevention. And then the last piece is that mental health is one of the Uh, only medical conditions that we routinely criminalize in our country. And so, uh, you know, when you look at things like the largest mental health provider being the LA County Jail, we're doing something wrong. So we want to fix especially the crisis response systems that lead people um, typically into the criminal justice system. That's a really big inflection point that we've got to fix. And Inseparable is focused on addressing all three of those areas really important topics on every front. And I'd like to maybe dig into these priorities a bit more. Um, Maybe we can start with the elimination of the treatment gap. What is the state of treatment access today for those who are unfamiliar? And what are you advocating specifically on that front? You know, it's, uh, if you, if you know folks who've tried to get help or access to uh, mental health professionals, it's really difficult. We take something that should be easy and we make it really hard. And when we talk about the treatment gap, we're talking about, um, at its core, about 30 million people out there we know in our country who, who need help and don't have access to it. But what does that mean? If you break it down, there are a lot of different reasons that all contribute to the treatment gap. The first one is the workforce. We don't have enough psychologists, psychiatrists, therapists, peer support uh, specialists. There are just not enough people out there to meet the demand. So um, that's sort of one of the major parts of it. And when you talk about workforce, um, it also doesn't always uh, look and live like the people who need help. So having a culturally competent and diverse workforce is really important so that you have people who understand your life experience um, and sometimes, frankly, even speak your language. 
Uh, so diversifying the work for, workforce is a really big piece of it. But you know, when you when you talk about workforce, we also can't get there even if we had every graduate school in America um, immediately start cranking out more and more professionals. And that's where technology comes in. And we know that there are other ways to address access by um, things like telehealth. It was frankly one of the only bright spots during the pandemic where we had more and more people getting access to uh, professionals that were in different locations, but the technology allowed them to, um, to get access to services. And so we think technology and the role that it can play in addressing the workforce piece in particular is a really important one to focus on. Uh, the, the second piece of the treatment gap for us is around integrating mental health um, everywhere that people show up in life. And one of the, the most important uh, integration issues is in primary care. So when you go to your doctor for your annual physical, they should be asking you about your mental health. And if you um, surface uh, a problem or an issue in those conversations, you should be directed to resources. But really, integration is about making sure that we talk about mental health everywhere people show up um, in life, whether it's school or work, places of worship, all sorts of different areas where we should be talking about it. It's also one where I think technology has a role to making mental health more prevalent in, in all the different systems out there that, that serve and interact with people. Um, and then the, the last part of the treatment gap is around parity, and which is a fancy word for making sure that uh, that mental health issues are reimbursed and paid for the same way other health uh, issues are. Because we know that people either uh, individually or through their employers um, or where they go to school have uh, access to health insurance that doesn't always cover mental health services. And so one of the things you have to do is really make sure that people are getting the treatment that they paid for and access to services that they paid for. And uh, so that's one area where we're particularly focused in making sure, frankly, that the health insurance companies do what they're supposed to do uh, in covering, um, you know, mental health and all of those things together um, contribute to the treatment gap. So we've got to address each of them um, with policy solutions. Thanks so much, Bill. Really great insights. And the next priority you had mentioned was around ensuring comprehensive school mental health. I'm really excited about this topic. You know, as you might know, we've got an entire youth track. Uh, what's inseparable doing on this front? It's so important to focus on youth. Uh, I think all the time of the, the Desmond Tutu quote, where instead of just fishing people out of the river, we need to go upriver and find out why they fell in in the first place. And that's what putting school mental health uh, services in place is all about. Um, because we know that these issues start early. Um, and we know, frankly, from the there's a national emergency right now that the American Academy of Pediatrics, the children's hospitals, and child psychologists have all declared a youth mental health emergency. And so one of the ways to not just be responding to children in crisis, but to, to get to them before there ever is a crisis is to focus on schools because every kid in America is um, in schools. And so one of the things we focused on specifically is the use of comprehensive school mental health systems. It's a model that uh, was put out by the National Center for School Mental Health. And it's a series of things that you need to do so that a school is um, not just a safe place for people experiencing mental health challenges, but it's a place where kids can thrive. And so last summer, we started the Hopeful Futures campaign that was specifically focused on a very bold goal of saying that every child in America needs to be in a school where they have access to the services they need. So what does that mean? It means that you have an adequate number of school mental health professionals, whether it's counselors or school psychologists or psychiatrists, that you have partnerships between schools, families, community organizations, that we train uh, teachers and other professionals in schools about how to uh, spot when a child might be having trouble with their mental health, making sure we have funding supports in place, doing regular well-being checks 
um, just an assessment of kids and how they're doing. And if, if something comes up in screening that we have the ability to then get them to the services that they need, like a counselor, um, and, you know, teaching them the basics about their own mental health in an age appropriate way. Um, if you, you think about all of the things that we want kids to know and that, frankly, when you talk to industry leaders, they say they want out of the workforce is for people to be able to regulate themselves, how they interact with others, how they manage emotions when things get stressful. Uh, and, and one thing we want to do is normalize that con uh, conversation about mental health from a very early age so that um, we are sending people out into the world uh, that are okay to talk about their mental health when they need to. And that will help it uh, help people access care. So to do all those things, because that's a lot, you know, I just said a whole bunch of things that we're trying to do in schools. Uh, we launched this campaign with 18 other organizations in the mental health space to specifically look at states and figure out where they are on school mental health policy. And in February, we put out uh, a report card because if it's schools, you got to have a report card uh, called America's School Mental Health Report Card that rates states on all of these different policy areas and says exactly where they are and what the ratios of counselors and psychiatrists they have, you know, what policies they have in place with a goal of giving activists and uh, hopefully your audience and a lot of the people we're working with a series of tools so that we can go into those conversations state by state and change the policies that we need to change and continue to measure and improve access to all of these things for children. That is just totally remarkable. Um, really excited for the audience to dig in more and learn more. And I'll be asking you where they can find out more. But you also have one really important um, third priority area, which is around stopping the criminalization of mental illness and, and how we can expand crisis responses. Tell us more about Inseparable's role. Absolutely. So, uh, Salome, as you know, the, the 988 three-digit number uh, is going live nationwide this summer so that people that are experiencing a mental health crisis um, can call that instead of calling 911. Because we know that right now the crisis response system, if someone, if you need someone to show up for someone in crisis, it usually involves the police who will be the first to tell you that they're not fully trained or equipped to handle a lot of these situations. And so uh, 988, when it goes live with text features, chat features, and, and uh, of course, voice, uh, will allow people to talk to someone who's trained to try to help them. And a lot of those situations um, can be resolved over the phone or via a text or a chat. Um, but the, the real issue with our crisis response system is after that, what happens if someone needs to show up? Um, and who are we sending? And, and are they trained in crisis response and helping someone get access to the care they need? And then the third leg of the stool uh, for crisis uh, involves a place for them to go and having a crisis response uh, facility where it's safe. Um, for them to go and to uh, then connect them with the services that they need beyond that immediate crisis. But when you think of this as a three-legged stool of someone to take your call or message when you're um, in crisis, someone to show up if need be, and then somewhere to go, we're not doing very well in many places in our country on having all three legs of the stool in place. And so what Inseparable is focused on, similar to what we did with school mental health and the report card that we issued is we're going to be producing a report uh, later this year to show exactly where uh, states are on all three legs of the crisis stool and giving people tools because we've got to advocate for this. Because when you think about it, um, if, if, you're, if you had a house fire and you call 911, they send the fire department and we've paid for those people to respond and those uh, the fire trucks. And if you needed to go to the hospital, right, the system to get you there and for you to get that care, we haven't really built that out for mental health. So part of what we're looking at is specific legislation right now that would define crisis response services and make sure that they're covered by insurance in the same way that if you, um, you know, had a physical health crisis, um, 
the response to that is covered. We think it needs to be covered for crisis as well. Defining what those services are and doing that in policy so that whether you have public or private insurance, uh, that's paid for and covered. And once we have the coverage piece in place, what that will do is really help build out the market so that more um, there are more offerings for crisis response, frankly. So that's one of the things we're focused on is that as 988 drives up this volume and attention that we're really focused on building out people to respond with mobile crisis teams and also places to go and getting the, the funding and all the structure uh, in place around that. It's really great to hear all that you're already preparing for the launch of 988. Um, can you help our audience understand what have been some of the exciting legislative milestones lately? We've had some great ones. And, uh, you know, of course, we've been working with partner uh, organizations at the federal level on uh, things related to school mental health, things related to crisis funding. Uh, in the last uh, budget that was just adopted, um, there was a huge uh, 90% increase in school mental health funding. So that was a, a very big win for us. But we've also been, as, as you can tell, um, focused at the state level where so many of these decisions are made. Uh, in May of last year, we passed a new law in Illinois that required insurance com- companies to treat mental health completely uh, the same. And so eliminated, frankly, the loopholes that they were using to not cover mental health. Um, In Alabama, just two months ago, we passed a bill to require every school system to have a mental health services coordinator and the funding for that, which is a really big deal for getting, especially to um, underserved kids that um, that we know we knew, frankly, before the pandemic that, um, you know, children of color and uh, children in poor school systems and communities don't have the same access. So having this be required to be in every district. Um, and to have funding for it, that it was a big win. In Illinois, um, similarly passed a bill to uh, put screening in place for kids in the seventh through twelfth grades, and uh, and ten million dollars to fund that. Uh, in uh, Delaware, right now, we've got three different bills that we're in the middle of. Uh, one that would uh, increase the number of counselors and school psychiatrists and psychologists for middle schools, because middle school is kind of that key age. Again, uh, also another screening bill in Delaware, a curriculum bill so that we're teaching age-appropriate mental health literacy. We also have a curriculum bill in Alaska um, that we're pursuing with another few weeks to go in the legislative session there. Uh, And in New Jersey, um, we're in the middle of a a bill to pass a requirement that um, school mental health services are covered by Medicaid and reimbursed, um, which is a big thing for, again, um, kids from marginalized communities. And so all of these different points of action, and we have a lot more states that have bills that are going right now, um, which which folks can check out on the Hopeful Futures website. Um, but, you know, we're moving forward. We're getting bills on governor's desks to be signed into law. Um, And that progress is really, really exciting for us Um, because for too long, we've just said, oh, there's a youth mental health crisis, but we haven't been proactively changing the policies to fix it. And the campaign is is, uh, on track to have a lot of big wins this year to to show that we can do that in red states and blue states, small states, big states, you know, uh, all parts of the country. Um, And so that's really exciting. Bill, it's just amazing what your team has already accomplished. And, you know, for those listening, it's really demonstrating the power of uh, using our collective voices advocacy. For those who are interested in just getting started in advocacy, do you have any advice for them? Uh, Number one, I would say dive in. There's so much to be done on this issue. And uh, when you when you talk to legislators, one of the things they will tell you is, wow, I don't get enough people talking to me about this, even though I know that it impacts so many families in my district. And so what they need is more people reaching out and engaging and just sharing your story. Um, you know, I have a kind of a hard story to share on the personal front. But what I've found is that when I do that, the advocacy door that is opened up through that conversation um, is is a really amazing thing that's how we get to all these policy wins I was just talking about. 
So, um, and for people that aren't really ready to share whatever their story may be, um, there are just other ways to, to say this matters to me, this matters to my family, um, and, and to, you know, uh, push candidates for office about how, what they think about uh, mental health um, and, and just make their voices heard and be a part of the conversation. Wonderful advice. Um, Bill, this has been a great discussion. I have so many more questions I want to ask you, but I can't believe we're already out of time. Um, how can listeners find more about your work? How can they get involved with Inseparable? Absolutely. Uh, come find us at inseparable.us and sign up. Uh, we promise we won't bug you when it's not important, but when it is, we'll ask you to help us because we really believe in building this chorus of voices and people talking about this issue is, is how we're going to change the system. So uh, join us. And if you want to learn more specifically around the school campaign, um, there's another website, hopefulfutures.us, uh, that, that has all the information about all the different great organizations and policies that are being pursued on that front as well. I know that all of the topics you covered today are things that are important to our audience. And so I'm really encouraging listeners to take that first step and get involved um, because we really do have the power to change things. And, and now is the time. So um, thank you again, Bill. Excellent discussion. Really appreciate your time. Absolutely. And thanks so much for your support and helping bring more people into this conversation.